I love trying to create that magic and I love taking big swings and sometimes they work and sometimes you get an exploding baby. Um, <laughs> you just never know. I'd like to welcome to the show, Stephen DeKnight. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm doing great. Great to be here. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show, man. I, I truly, truly appreciate it. Uh, like I was saying before we started, I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of, uh, of uh, what, you've been, what you've been doing for a while, man. And I, I can't wait to get into it. So before we get started, man, how did you get into the business? Oh, now that's a story. Um, <laughs> I, I actually uh, grew up in South Jersey. Back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, I was born in 65, um, you know, back and uh, I literally was born and grew up in an area that didn't, didn't even have a zip code. It was so small. Right. I, I lived on a, a tiny little road called Dutch Neck Road. It sounds, sounds made up. <laughs> but, uh, RD4, I think it was, uh, Rural District 4, uh, way out in the sticks in South Jersey. Um, and... Uh, I grew up love, loving monsters and horror movies and science fiction movies. I used to spend hours building the old Aurora horror models. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just loved that kind of stuff. Um, eventually, we moved to a town called uh, Millville, which was about an hour, hour and 20 minutes from Atlantic City down in South Jersey. And that's where I spent, you know, my my teen years um, uh, all the way through high school. And I, I just, again, uh, at one point I wanted to be a stop uh, motion animation guy because I loved Willis O'Brien and, and Ray Harryhausen. And, uh, then I switched to, I wanted to be a special effects makeup guy. Um, uh, because I was a, a huge fan of what Dick Smith was doing. Mm hmm um, I actually remember, you know, and I, I back then without the Internet and only three stations on the TV, uh, information was hard to come by. Uh, people don't understand that we're born after mm -hmm. uh, the age of the Internet, just how hard it was to find stuff. So my lifeline being way out in the sticks was magazines like uh, Starlog and uh, Famous Monsters of Filmland, Fangoria. And I remember in an issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland, they, they usually had a page or two that highlighted fans who were doing amazing model work or, or uh, makeup work. And they had some pictures in there from a, a young teenage uh, aspiring makeup artist named Rick Baker. <laughs> and uh, I, I think the picture showed he had done this prosthetic that showed like a a broken arm with a bone poking through. And I thought, man, I want to do that. But I couldn't get any of the materials. I didn't know how to get any of the materials. Uh, and I was just lost. Um, so eventually I, I started wanting to be an actor. I, I did a lot of acting in, in high school. And uh, when I finally went to college, I went to UC Santa Cruz uh, from 85 to 89. Um, and I went primarily as an actor to study acting. And after about two years in the undergraduate program, I realized I was an OK actor. I wasn't a fantastic actor. And I'm not a big guy. I'm about five, seven. At the time, I weighed maybe 120 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> so I wasn't a leading man. I didn't have the chops of a Dustin Hoffman or an Al Pacino. <laughs> but I'd always been interested in writing. So I started writing plays. Uh, and uh, putting them on at UC Santa Cruz. From that, I got accepted into the uh, graduate playwriting program at UCLA, uh, which to me was always one step closer. I loved the theater. Uh, I will always love the theater. Um, but trying to make it as a working playwright in this day and age is such a small target. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and I had always loved movies and television. That was my main thing that I was a big fan of. So I went to UCLA with the idea of going through the playwriting program and then eventually breaking into movies. Um, so I spent two years at the playwriting department. Then I stayed an extra year uh, to go through the screenwriting department. And then I got out. This was uh, in 89. And I thought, well, give it about six months and I'll be writing features. So uh, I got a, 
a part-time job as a uh, uh, English as a second language teacher in a little Japanese private school in the valley in uh, Van Nuys. And I thought, well, I'll be here six months, maybe seven before I break in. Uh, six and a half years later, I'm still an <laughs> English teacher at this little Japanese school. Uh, getting older by the day. And, uh, you know, I would work during the day and then I would go home and write all night. And I kept writing one feature after another that nobody wanted. Uh, you know, just no excitement whatsoever. Um, and I was entering all the contests. And one of the big ones, of course, is the Nicole Fellowship mm -hmm. uh, screenwriting contest. And one year I made it, uh, you know, there was 4,000 people that entered the contest and I made it down to the final five and I lost. But that's, and but, that that's point, a but that's a win at that point. It's a win, but it's it's a painful win. I was that close. And then it was a kick in the nuts. Um, as, but I dusted myself off. And but because of that, I got some interest from some some agencies. Uh, all very, very, very small. So I was able to sign my first, what I consider real agent. I had had tangential agents and I had one manager that went really poorly. Um, so I never had real rep. So I signed up with a, 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 a very small, it was actually an actor's agency that had one literary agent in it. Uh, a, a lovely woman, uh, but I think she was, she was getting towards the end of her career. Um, but, uh, she was great. Uh, really still couldn't get a lot of traction. Um, but, uh, I had a friend that I went to Santa Cruz with a guy named Dale Roy Robinson, wonderful friend of mine. Um, he calls me up out of the blue and says, Hey, I'm working as a production coordinator on this, uh, MTV show, uh, being produced by, of all people, Roland Joppy, the guy that did The Killing Fields, mm -hmm. The Mission. And it's a it's a weird little teen sex comedy called Undressed. And he said, I don't think it's going to be picked up, but if it does, I can get your stuff to Roland Joppy's people. And I go, oh, okay, great. Six months later, he calls me up and says, hey, they picked it up. Uh, send me whatever you have in TV, and I'll give it to uh, Roland's people. Um, at the time, I was doing just features. So, uh, but I did do, uh, probably about six months before my friend called me up, just uh, an exercise in television. Uh, and I wrote a spec, Deep Space Nine, uh, which was a show I was really enjoying at the time. As I discovered later, nobody wanted to read it, including the people at Deep Space Nine. Uh, but it was, a, it was a really, it was kind of a, a, a big adventure story with a lot of humor in it. It was about why Ferengis are so small. Mm -hmm. And it was basically through genetics. Uh, it, it starts off with Worf encountering a Ferengi as big as he is, where you find out they used to be that big. <laughs> but through genetic engineering, they made themselves smaller so people wouldn't know that they were they, they wouldn't think they were a threat. Um, so I send uh, this Deep Space Nine script to my friend for Roland Joffe's teen sex comedy on MTV. Uh, and he asked me, do you have anything else? I go, nope, that's it for TV. So he goes, all right, great. So he sends it to Roland Joffe's people. And this is, was my first uh, big bit of luck is that Reddit was a huge Deep Space Nine fan. Mm. So he read it. He loved it. And based off that, I got on to this uh, crazy <laughs> MTV sex comedy, um, which was uh, a great uh, learning ground of how to write fast under pressure. <laughs> Because the first season, we did 30 half-hour episodes. It aired four nights a week. And we, from start to finish, from scripts to posts, you know, shooting the whole thing, I think we had 15 or 16 weeks to do everything. So it was just a machine. We were just grinding. And, and the show um, became a hit for uh, MTV. Uh, so I was on there for about four seasons, uh, but it's like dog years. It was like maybe 18 months. We did four seasons. And by the last season, we were doing, I think, 40 episodes in like 20 weeks. And it was such a grind. Jesus. And there's only so many ways you can get um, undressed? teenage undressed? characters undressed. <laughs> Literally, I remember my breaking point was these two teenage girls were having a conversation 
and my edict was you've got to get them partially undressed. And literally one of the girls goes, this tag on my shirt is driving me crazy. Zoop. And I thought my soul just left my body. I, I thought I, uh, you know, I'm appreciative that I have a paying job, but my God, I've got to try to parlay this into because uh, who knows how long the show is going to go. And I mean, a side story. I work with some great people. Uh, Lizzie Weiss, who went on to write Blue Crush um, in in uh, several TV shows, and of, of course, uh, the the big name that came out of there was Damon Lindelof. Side story for everybody out there struggling. Um, Dale and I thought Damon Lindelof was an amazing writer, just an incredible find. The head writer didn't like him and didn't like his writing and kept rewriting him, rewriting his fantastic dialogue and making it terrible. Um, So (laughs) that can happen to the best of us. Uh, So why I was uh, in that last season of Dress, I thought, okay, I've got an agent. I actually have a paying job. I need to try to maybe get an agent at one of the bigger agencies so I can get more opportunities. So uh, I thought it's time to write another spec, another TV spec. My two favorite shows at the time were um, NYPD Blue and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And I had stories for both of them. And I decided to write the Buffy spec. And I always wondered where my career would have gone if I went NYPD Blue. So I write this Buffy spec called Xander the Slayer, and it was basically Xander accidentally gets Buffy's powers transferred to him. And it was all about why men can't be slayers, because basically it goes to their heads and they become uncontrollable. Um, I, so I finished the script and uh, my friend Lizzie Weiss, who had worked on Undressed, uh, she was repped at UTA. Uh, so I call up Lizzie and I say, oh, Lizzie, could you pass the script to your agent? And she said, yeah, yeah, sure. So she passes it over to UTA. And then a couple of weeks later, I get a call that says they liked it, but they just don't think it's for them. Uh, so I'm like, oh, well, that's disappointing. So um, I gave it to my feature agent, uh, who literally only knew three people in TV. <laughs> but one of them was the head of Joss Whedon's company. So it gets over there. They read it. They like it. I go over and I interview for a job on the animated show that Jeff Loeb is uh, trying to get off the ground. Um, But at the end of this interview, they say, but Joss has to read it. And just to warn you, he usually doesn't like Buffy specs. I go, oh, okay, great. So they they give it to Joss. And a couple of weeks later, I get a call that he wants to talk to me. I go in and we talk about movies and comic books. And at the end, he says, I know you were talking about the animated show, but do you want to come do an episode of the live action show? And I was like, hell yes. So I I did a freelance of the live action show and uh, they invited me to the production meeting. And uh, after that was over, uh, they told me to hang around. So I was sitting in this big empty room for like 15 minutes wondering, you know, what do you need more rewrites? What do you want? And then a PA popped up and took me down to the Magic Box set. And uh, Joss was there in Oxen. And they said, look, we like you. We like your work. You want to come join us full time? And uh, I I just about burst into man tears uh, (laughs) because it was my absolute favorite show on TV. And uh, I loved all the writers that I'd been working with. So I said, absolutely, of course. So I always really consider that the real start of my career. That's when things really started to uh, happen for me. Right. right. Uh, and again, all based on a spec. And, you know, there's this thing that goes around town where people say, ah, you know, you can never get hired on the show if you write a spec for that show. Right. Complete bullshit. When I was doing Spartacus, if some writer had handed in a script that was at least 80 percent close, I would have scooped them up in a hot second. Interesting. Uh, to know that somebody could could write the show. It's tricky because you have to really be able to nail it. Uh, so you got another way because I was going to say that because I'm hearing that I'm like, you, that's generally against the, the common knowledge of don't write a spec of the show you're trying to get on. So if you want to get on Big Bang Theory, don't write a Big Bang Theory spec. But when you were saying all that, you've just got to the window to hit it is a lot shorter and closer if you're if you're writing a big bang theory to get on a a friends (laughs) i know there's two different eras but you know what i mean um that's that's a looser 
a loose, oh, he, I could see the talent, but if you're nailing the characters that these writers, like if someone in Spartacus, you know that char those characters so well, they got to really understand the voice and really understand that. But, but if you nail it, you know, you're good. You're in. And, and, and the next year when I was on Buffy, uh, uh, Joss hired another writer that had written a Buffy spec, uh, Drew Greenberg. So it, it absolutely can work. Uh, but I, I wouldn't suggest that somebody like write a, a spec script of a specific show specifically to get on that show. Cause that's not why I wrote, I wrote it as a sample to show what I could do. It just so happened that I ended up on Buffy. I was considered that winning the lottery for me uh, at the time. Um, more than anything, when you're writing a spec script, my my big uh, advice is you've got to kill it. You have to love this story. And it has to really be something special, not just for the reader, but for you. Uh, don't just pound out a, a spec script because, you know, you feel like you have to. Even with the Deep Space Nine thing, I wrote that one from my heart because I was really excited about this story about a giant Ferengi. Um, <laughs> you know, you just and that kind of passion. It's it's what I look for as a showrunner now when I read a, a, a sample. Right. Is that I don't care. It could be, uh, you know, I could be uh, looking for writers on a big sci fi show and get that's like a. A, a spec Friday night lights. As long as it's good, I don't care. Uh, action, the sci-fi stuff, uh, as far as I'm concerned, anybody can do that. I mean, that's, it's character and dialogue that's difficult. So, I mean, so you spent some time over in Buffy and Angel, um, which is the spinoff yeah. of, of Buffy. Um, I was mm -hmm. a huge Buffy fan. I mean, but when Buffy came out, it was, it was revolutionary in many ways. Like there was just really nothing, was. nothing like that strong female lead. Um, you know, I mean, and I think the only way a show like that could have gotten on air is by a fledgling new yeah. channel like the WB that was just trying to find its its roots. Um, and I've heard Sarah, Sarah Michelle uh, say many times, she's like, a lot of people look at this as it was a hit. Like there was absolutely, it was called, there was a show called Buffy the Vampire Slayer yeah, on a show honest. with a dancing frog. Yeah. Um, there was, there's no guarantees of anything <laughs> happening with that. I, I remember when I first heard about it, uh, I, I thought they're making a TV series out of that movie that wasn't so good. <laughs> That's uh, an interesting choice. And of course, at the time, I didn't know anything about the backstory about the movie. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, it, it was such a surprise, especially since if people remember the WB at the time was really known for half hour urban comedies. That's what right. they were doing. That's right. what their bread and butter was. And uh, the, the quickest way I, I have realized <laughs> in my 20 years in the business, the quickest way to rise uh, uh, meteorically in your career as a writer showrunner is be the guy that launches a network <laughs> that gets their first. It's like what it's like what Sean Ryan did with mm -hmm. uh, the shield. Um, and it's it's also what uh, Matthew Weiner did with Mad Men. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember for a couple of years in a row, I would get calls from my agent. Uh, I remember they called up and said, hey, a AMC is doing original programming. Do you want to talk to them? This was before Mad Men. And my reaction was, AMC? I'm on a network with 22 ups a year. Why would I want to go to AMC? And then I had the, the, you know, the same thing with several of these. And then when it finally got to, they called me up and said, hey, stars wants to do original programming and i said yes i'll talk to him <laughs> yeah obviously <laughs> over there oh, oh yeah um, what's the address let me go exactly yeah exactly <laughs> so you also so you 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 um you did you you did your time over at buffy and angel then you jumped onto smallville which was yeah. also fairly kind of revolutionary of a show i remember because it, it was you know you're tackling one of the most famous characters yeah. in history um but I, it seemed like you guys had a ball just exploring all of those things in in in, in Clark Kent's and Superman's early life. Um, that must have been a ball to, to be working on. It was. Uh, you, you know, it was it was completely different from the way we worked on Buffy and Angel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my, and again, this goes back to my uh, Jeff Loeb, uh, who I'd met 
uh, through uh, Joss on Buffy and Angel, um, he was working with Miles Miller and uh, uh, Al Goff, who created Smallville. Uh, and he was over there on Smallville and he, he was trying to get me to come over. So I came over and, and interviewed with him and really liked the guys and ended up going over there. Um, it, it was into uh, Smallville was interesting. Obviously, it's a different animal in many ways. Uh, Smallville was much more hard on your sleeve earnest than Buffy and Angel. Um, and also with Smallville, uh, you had all the Superman mythology. <sighs> And you had to get the approval of the feature side uh, to right. bring in characters. Like I remember, uh, Alan Miles always wanted to bring in. I would never let them. Which one? I'm sorry. What was the character? Uh, uh, Bruce Wayne. Oh yeah, I was always wondered yeah. at that. And was it true that you could they couldn't wear the cape? Like the cape was not allowed. Uh, like the correct. suit. I uh, didn't want him in the suit. Right. Yeah. Not until that, I think that that very last shot. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my time on Smallville was uh, I, had, I had a blast. Uh, I also look at, um, you know, I was doing a lot of writing on the scripts. And every year, uh, you know, like fan sites would put like the top five episodes in the worst five. And I was always in both. It was like I was always in. And they were completely right. I did some really shit episodes um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, haunt me to this day. I always joke about the exploding baby episode. There's an episode called Ageless where Clark and Lana find a baby that's rapidly in spurts getting older until it explodes. I, call I, it I, I vaguely remember that episode. I remember because it was terrible. it was a, a horrifying terrible. imagery. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in a, a horrifying episode. The funny story about that is uh, I was in the room breaking this, and this was the first one that I was directing for them. I had directed three episodes of Angel. This was my first uh, directing for Smallville. So we were in the room breaking my story, and I was very excited to tell this story about kryptonite zombies, which is basically Le LexCorp, a truck classic like uh, you know Return of the Living Dead set up. This LexCorp truck is transporting... Um, the radioactive sludge from their experiments with Obvi the kryptonite. Obviously. Uh, through a rainstorm, the truck overturns and it leaks into a graveyard and it's kryptonite zombies. And Clark is, is like powerless against the kryptonite zombies. And they surround the farm and they can't get out of the farmhouse and he can't use his powers. And I was like, oh, kryptonite zombies, now you're talking, this is my stuff. I go off to do a rewrite on another script. I come back in. I bump into Al <laughs> in the hallway and he goes, hey, hey, we've changed your episode. Great news. This is a great story. Clark and Lana find the baby. And I'm like, the fuck just happened? Where, 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 where did the kryptonite where zombies the kryptonite go? Kryptonite zombies. So, so we did that episode. Um, it, it did not turn out well. I mean, it, through, through no one's fault except my own because I just couldn't get my head around it. And uh, I almost stopped directing then. <laughs> uh, I was supposed to direct the next season. I passed. I said, ah. And then uh, in the third season, I uh, I, I directed the, uh, the 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 Justice League episode, Justice. Yeah. Um, which, which I felt like <laughs> kind of vindicated myself after the exploding baby episode. Uh, <laughs> but it was great fun to work in that world, and yeah. uh, everybody was the actors were so wonderful on that show, especially Tom Welling. I can't say enough good things about Tom Welling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you would think that he would have a big head and be very difficult. Quite the opposite. I remember uh, we were in some shooting in some gas station way out on the outskirts of Vancouver. And uh, I, I'm sitting in my chair prepping for like the next scene. And he walks by with a sandwich and he goes, hey, they have sandwiches. You want me to get you one? I'm like, what? What star of a show does that? And he was gracious and wonderful all the way through the show. Uh, just really. And, and Michael Rosenbaum, who played Lex mm -hmm. uh, brilliantly, uh, what, uh, well, what I loved about him, one of the funniest guys I've ever met, he would be telling this crazy story. He told some story about when he got into a fight and got knocked out. And uh, we were literally in tears listening to him. It was so funny. And then they were ready to go um, to uh, shoot the scene. And just like that, he becomes Lex Luthor. Uh, 
I, know, I, like the opposite of a method actor. He could just switch from one to the other. It's every, like every time I see an actor do that on set, I, I, I in the back of my head, I hear John Lovitz yell, acting! It's, yeah. <laughs> from the SNL exactly. skit, acting! It's like, it's just... Exactly. It's so amazing to see them just on it. It's scary, actually, sometimes. It's very yeah. off-putting when you could see... And I've seen them turn on the tears. The te like They could turn oh, yeah. te tears on like water. And then they'll yep. stop, and I'm like, so when's lunch? And I'm like, oh my God, like, how do you do that it's a yeah. it's it's, I, it's remarkable i remember a story i don't know if it was uh al or joss or who told me uh, working with an actor or an actress and uh they needed her to cry and she asked uh, which eye which <laughs> i want the tear to come out and i'm like jesus now that's a talent oh yeah that's uh yeah, yeah. I've, I've worked with actresses like that it's just it's just remarkable it's amazing now you know, writing is such a solitary profession. It's something that you do alone uh, in a room. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if it's in a room like yours, which is super cool, if no one's if no one's seen the video, <laughs> you've got toys and you know books everywhere. It's very inspirational. The way it should be <laughs> as the way it should be exactly. But um, but since it's such a solitary uh, profession, how do you work within the hive mind of a writer's room? Uh, there are a few things I love more. Uh, the, the writer's room, and, and I was really spoiled with the writer's room in Buffy and Angel because it was such a great group of people, and we had so much fun. Uh, I, I always marvel. I was talking to Jeff Bell the other day um, from Angel. He ended up running uh, season four and five. Um, just marveling about how did we do 22 episodes a year? How did we get all that done? Because we were always having so much fun. Uh, it was just literally nonstop hilarity. Um, and the writer's room, to me, is one of the best places you can possibly be. Um, I, I enjoy, an, you know, a really loose, fun writer's room. Um, the, I also don't believe in staying to like midnight. Uh, no good has ever come in a writer's room after dinner. It is <laughs> It just doesn't. It is. Uh, it's like if like if you're going to an eight. No, nothing good has come from an ATM at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Nothing good is happening nothing. with the money you're pulling out. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. So uh, so for me, once I became a showrunner, um, I, it, I I always tell everybody coming in, look, everybody has a life. Uh, we should be able to get everything we need to get done from 10 till four. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if we're here on the weekends or we're here till nine o'clock, something's gone horribly wrong. And that should only be like in a, you know, break glass in case of an emergency. Um, so for me, the writer's room, it's it, it's such a, it's almost like college. It's like being back in college. It's just <laughs> yeah. joyous, raucous fun. Is it a hard work? Is there a lot of pressure? Yeah. Um, but also most shows aren't 22 episodes anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a which is a a positive and a negative, uh, because while most shows aren't 22 episodes, they're usually, you know, eight to 13 now, especially on streaming. Oftentimes it takes almost as much time in the writer's room as it did for 22, because there's they're they're much more um, handcrafted episodes now instead of more of a mass produced. When we were doing 22, uh, I remember on. Smallville, we would always come in and say, well, it's 22. Five are going to be great. There's going to be a bunch that's going to be pretty good. And there's going to be five to eight that are just suck because we ran out of time. And that's just, you just have to accept that. We ran out of time. We ran out of money. When you're doing eight episodes, you can't have two of them suck. Right. They all have to be fantastic. So you sweat every single one. But the writer's room is just such a fantastic place it, it, it's a place that's changed for the better as uh, i remember when i got the opportunity to run spartacus i really wanted a diverse writer's room uh very inclusive i was looking uh, you know for a broad range of voices and uh at that time which was i i think i started working on it in late 2008 uh sounds about right when I was brought in 2008, 2009, it premiered in, you know, it would be 2008. Um, so I, I, I sent out word to all the agencies what I was looking for. And all I got were white males because at the time, uh, 
that's what the agencies were used to dealing with. And that's what everybody wanted to hire. Right. And I had a devil of a time. I remember um, at a fantastic uh, Asian writer, um, uh, Miranda Kwok, uh, that I found through a, through a friend said, hey, uh, you should read this script. It's pretty good. Um, and so it was really difficult. But flash forward um, about eight, nine years later, when I was putting the room together for Jupiter's Legacy, um, it was a completely different story. Uh, finally, the agencies had called up, the studios had called up. So I was able to put together a room that was half female, uh, half diverse, um, and very inclusive. And it made for a much better experience, in, in my opinion, and not just on the words on the page, but being in the room and uh, and, and just having such a fantastic time. Now, um, you you came to kind of, you kind of got your your own footing, if you will, with Spartacus. Like, how did you yeah. how did you bring Spartacus to a contemporary audience? Because when you think Spartacus, you think the old yeah. Kubrick, the old Kubrick film, you sure. know, with Kirk Douglas and stuff. You're like, yeah. OK, Sands and Swords, got it, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, and, and I think this is post 300, right? So 300 already had yep. come out. So 300 and, and also Gladiator obviously had already come out yeah. as well. So there was reference <laughs> other than the Kubrick yeah. thing. But Definitely. when you think but you think Spartacus, that's the first thing that comes to mind. So how did you that's what I thought? Right. So how did you bring it to a contemporary audience? How did you tackle this? So uh, that's a story. Um, <laughs> so. After uh, after Smallville, uh, I wanted to do something new, something <laughs> exciting. And I, I've always been a big fan of the Dennis Potter musicals, uh, the singing detective, Pennies from Heaven. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I finished my three year contract on Smallville and I was looking for my next thing. And I was talking to the people at Chuck about possibly coming on there. Uh, I was talking to the uh, uh, people over on the Sarah Connor Chronicles about mm -hmm. possibly coming over there. Uh, they were both Warner Brothers for whatever reason, lowballed me on what they were willing to pay me. And uh, out of the blue, uh, uh, Sony pops up with a remake of a, of a British uh, TV musical that I loved uh, called Viva Blackpool. They were doing a version with Hugh Jackman called Viva Laughlin. And I, uh, I saw like a clip from their pilot and I said, that's what I want to do. My agents were like, are you sure? I go, yes, that's what I want to do. And it turned out to be one of the most hysterical debacles I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> Um, yeah, because I, I, I didn't see the four seasons of that. I don't, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't see four seasons. It was like two episodes. Exactly. Uh, yeah, literally. So I, I, and there was a, a whole kinds of craziness going on. Uh, for people that know LA, LA we were um, uh, originally our offices, our temporary offices when we first started up. I came in after the pilot was shot. I was a co-executive producer on the show. Um, were over by Universal Studios in that area. And uh, and I thought, oh, okay, great. I, I lived in West Hollywood. It was like, eh, it's a commute, but it's not that bad. So I'm there for about two weeks when they said, uh, great, we're going to be moving to our new permanent offices uh, next week. I'm like, what? Who? What? Where are we going? Santa Clarita. I was like, oh. Santa Clarita. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Oh, whoever where Magic Mountain is. So I had to go from West Hollywood to Santa Clarita it's every like an day. Hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes or longer, isn't it? Yeah, it was like an hour and a half because everything's <laughs> fine until you hit the traffic on the 101 near Hollywood and then you're there for 45 minutes. Um, so so that was that was the first warning sign. Uh, their major casino set, because it centered around um Laughlin, Nevada, and this guy opening his own casino. The major casino set was in Beverly Hills. So if we wanted to visit that set, you know, I had to go from West Hollywood, check into the office, go to Beverly Hills, um, go back to Santa Clarita. And then it was it was it was a nightmare of epic proportions. And the show CBS tested. It was a CBS show. They tested the pilot which tested fantastic until people started singing. And then it was like somebody unplugged the, the equipment. It just went, <laughs> went dead. So uh, CBS kind of tried to hide the fact that it was a musical and all the promos. And uh, so the show premiered on a special 
slot Thursday mm-hmm. uh, after CSI, where we lost like 10 million viewers from, from CSI. And then it, the second episode aired that Sunday at its regular slot. I think we lost 10 million more viewers. And driving into work on Monday, they say, yeah, you canceled. Um, and it was also one of the strangest uh, experiences I've had. So, so we, everybody gets there we, uh, to the office in Santa Clarita. We tell them we've been canceled. You know, we're having kind of the, the wake for the show. And uh, we get an urgent call from the building's facility manor saying, everybody has to evacuate now. Uh, Santa Clarita is on fire. Of course. So, so driving out, the hills are on fire. It was like a hellscape. <laughs> a, like thousands of crows descended. I'm not shitting. I don't know where the crows came from. It was literally apocalyptic. It's like God didn't like the show. <laughs> It's like, you're done. <laughs> you're out. So uh, this is all, I swear, it's leading to Spartacus. Mm-hmm. So a couple of weeks after that, the writer's strike happened. So now I'm out on a picket line. And in my mind, it was like, really, the strike couldn't have happened a few weeks earlier. So it wouldn't have so much been canceled. We just would have disappeared. So I find myself on a picket line outside of a Fox. And who do I bump into? Joss Whedon. My old boss. And he said, hey, uh, I just sold a show to uh, Fox right before we went on strike. I'd love to talk to you about coming to work on it after this is over. I go, yeah, great. Um, And that turned out to be Dollhouse. Dollhouse, So I I came in at Dollhouse after the strike was over as a consulting producer. One of the sweetest deals of my life. Uh, uh, I was originally talking about coming in as the second in command, uh, but then it went another way. And I'm totally fine. I'm fine with that. But uh, I'll come in as a consulting producer for three days a week. I'll do a little writing. I'll do a little directing. I said, I'll come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, don't talk to me Friday through Monday. Because <laughs> I need to rest. Because I need to rest. I need to rest, <laughs> uh, which gave me time to work on some other stuff. Um, so I did that. I was gearing up to direct uh, episode two of Dollhouse. Um and I get a call from my agents, and this was the call I referred to earlier, where it's like, hey, Stars wants to do some Gladiator series with uh, Sam Raimi. Um, they want to talk to you. You interested? I'll be right over. Uh, more than anything, I love Sam Raimi since I was sure. a kid. Sure. I mean, uh, ever since I saw the first Evil Dead movie mm-hmm. uh, at a drive-in. Uh, so um, I hot-footed over, and it's the Stars executives. And at the time... Uh, stars, um, I think they had one comedy and I think they were getting ready or just about to air, uh, crash. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was produced by Lionsgate. They wanted this show to be the first ones that they actually produced and owned themselves. So I get in the room with the stars executives and, um, on a speaker phone is, uh, Sam Raimi was nowhere to be found. I think he was shooting a movie at the time. Um, but Rob Tappert, his producing partner, who was with him all the way back, you know, back in the Michigan days with Evil Dead, uh, was on the speakerphone from New Zealand, where he, he had relocated when he did uh, Hercules and Xena. And uh, so they tell me, yeah, we want to do Spartacus. And I was like, Spartacus? Ooh, I don't know. I, you know, I was a huge fan of the Kubrick movie. Mm-hmm. And that's daunting to to try to take that on. So we talked about it and uh, we all liked each other. So at at the end of the meeting, they said, great. uh, We love what we're hearing. Uh, When can you start? And I said, in about two months, I'm about to go direct this thing for Joss Whedon on the show I'm on. And they said, oh, well, we can't wait that long. Um, We're going to have to to keep looking. I go. Uh, Godspeed. Sorry, I'm I'm tied up. So I was actually on set shooting this episode of Dollhouse when my agents popped up and said, hey, stars called again. They've talked to a lot of people. They haven't found anybody they liked as much as you. Would you still be interested? And I said, hell yeah. So I literally on uh, a couple of weeks later on a Friday locked my cut of that episode of Dollhouse. And then on Monday started on Spartacus. And uh, I've mentioned this before in interviews. I didn't know anything about Roman history. The the extent of my knowledge of Roman history was Kubrick, Spartacus, you know, Gladiator, uh, 
Gladiator, Ben Hur, uh, <laughs> you, you know, all the, all of those old swords and sandals epics. Mm. Um, so I, I quickly started reading up about the Third Servile War uh, that Spartacus was involved in, and and I realized that. So much of the story is just made up because there's not, you know, there's a lot of information about who won this battle and who won that battle, but there's not a lot of character stuff. And and even uh, in, it, this comes into play in the show. His true name has been lost through the ages. Nobody knows what his real name was. Uh, he was named Spartacus after an ancient king uh, by the Romans. Uh, no. You know, nobody knows uh, who he was, and um, no one ever found his body after that last battle because there were just thousands of, of dead bodies. Um, so, so we launch into it, and, and this is where I find out is how Rob Tappard sold this show to stars, which is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. He he, he showed me uh, a- after I was on board. He basically sent them a DVD. It was like an old William Castle kind of thing. It's him sitting at his desk and uh, talking to the camera, and he's saying, wouldn't it be great if we did a show about Spartacus, and it looked like this? And then they showed clips from 300 and Gladiator. <laughs> and, uh, and, and people at first were saying, oh, it looks like a 300 ripoff. And we were always very honest and upfront that we loved what Zack Snyder and Larry Fong did with 300. And we wanted to take that technology and take what they did and see if it would translate into a TV show, a mm-hmm. weekly TV show. Um, so we owe a huge debt to Zack Snyder and Larry Fong uh, with the work they did on 300, which was just revolutionary. Um, so we dive into uh, Spartacus. I, I start reading every book on Romans and the Third Servile War. Uh, we hire a couple of uh, PhD Roman history experts who are just invaluable And then we start, you know, forming the story together. And uh, I approach Spartacus like I do almost everything I work on is a love story, first and foremost. Um, uh, It could be, you know, uh, love between friends, love between a husband and wife. Um, And uh, so we start working on it. And, uh, uh, you know, the first episode, uh, which I think is the worst episode of the series, uh, and not because of the actors or the directors or anything. It's basically the way the script was constructed. Um, you know, there were uh, a lot of cooks in the kitchen, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but I think we bit off a little bit more than we could chew. We had a very limited budget, and um, there was it was just too expensive. So at the last minute, we had to start whittling things down, and unfortunately, a lot of the things that got whittled down was the connective tissue. And also that first episode, if you look at it, it's very comic booky graphic novel because we were still trying to figure out exactly the techniques. And also we were shooting it in New Zealand. So there was kind of we used a lot of the same crew as Hercules and Xena. And it just took everybody to realize that that's not what we were actually doing. <laughs> right. Um, so by the time we got to episode four. Uh, thankfully, uh, we had figured it out. That's an episode called The Thing in the Pit, where Spartacus is, is sent to this underground uh, fighting pits. And at that point, everything started to click. Uh, on the writing side, we kind of dialed it in. On the production side, we dialed it in. And, and from there, we took off. Uh, it, it's also, it was one of, the fr- one of the early shows that went straight to series instead of doing a pilot, mm-hmm. which is why the pilot's a little wonky. Uh, It was something pretty new back at that time. Now now we do it all the time. It's mostly just a straight to series order. Um, And uh, thankfully, uh, the thing that I think made the show a big hit, because we were airing each week. It wasn't, you know, uh, dropping all the episodes at the same time. And I remember when the first episode came out, uh, Stars sends you a big book of all the reviews. And it was just page after page trying to find something that somebody said good. Right. Everybody hated it. One reviewer said it was the worst uh, TV show of the decade. And this wow. came out January 2010. So the decade just started. <laughs> um, but thankfully, we had completed all the episodes. We, can, we had already shot all 13. And Stars was airing all 13. This wasn't network television where they were going to cancel it. Mm-hmm. 
And we knew starting at episode four, things got a lot better. Um, and stars made a deal with Netflix to show the episodes weekly. And that's what really helped us. Right. Because it really found an audience between stars and Netflix. It found an audience. And by the end of that first season, uh, a lot of the reviewers that saw that first episode and hated it circled back around and said, you know what? You all should check this out because it actually gets a lot better. That's, so, that's, awesome. that's awesome. Yeah. So we had a bit of a, a bumpy start. And, and then, of course, sadly, as everybody knows, right. our star, Andy Whitfield, passed away. Right. Um, we were uh, prepping season two when we found out that he had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, so we had a lot of talks about, do we cancel the show? Do we shut the show down? Uh, we can't wait two years to do the next installment because we'll lose the audience. So we started, we kept working on season two, but we kept talking about, you know, we want to give Andy time to go through treatment and get better. And um, so I approached uh, Stars and Rob Tappert about wh what if we did like a, a two episode, like mini movie prequel. And uh, Star says, well, two episodes, it's not worth the money to do two episodes. And uh, then the suggestion was made, what about four episodes? And I felt like, it's too many episodes for a concise story, not long enough for a full story. Uh, and, and then eventually they came back and they said, well, what, what about six episodes? And we're like, yeah, that's just right. So that's why we did Gods of the Arena, uh, the prequel to give Andy time to go through his treatments. And uh, it, it's also, you know, it's one of those things. It was born through a very tragic situation, right. but it's also, I think, one of the seasons I'm most proud of. Uh, because it just seemed like everything was clicking. And we got to in, in, introduce Gannicus, which we were got, going to bring into the show. But we got to introduce him in a way where you really got to know him. Um, and uh, then Andy Whitfield got a clean bill of health. And uh, we went to Comic-Con and we brought him and we announced he was coming back. And that we started to gear up for season two again. And then we got the call that the cancer came back. And, uh, and he passed away a couple of months later. Uh, which was really, really sad. And, and, and you know, we, we were faced with a choice again. Do we keep going? And, and Andy uh, was, was very firm at us to finish telling the story. Um, so we did a big uh, worldwide search and we found Liam McIntyre to carry on the show, which uh, was, I, I can't give enough props to Liam. It was such a hard thing to step into. And Liam was a huge fan of the show. Mm -hmm. and Andy's work. So that made it doubly difficult. <clears throat> but um, yeah, it, it was, uh, it, and what really made it special is our executives at Stars at the time, uh, most of them were used to programming, uh, you know, movies and specials on Stars. So when they would have a question or they were uncomfortable with something we were doing, uh, Rob Tappert and I would say, no, trust us. This is this is how it should work. And you're going to be very happy. And they would say, well, you're the experts. Go ahead. Um, so they were wonderfully supportive, very hands off. And uh, and the way we approached the show, Rob and I had some very early conversations uh, because stars wanted to do a male driven action show, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm all for. But I I have ulterior motives. <laughs> You know, I, I'm a bit of a lefty and I wanted to work in the ideas about, you know, uh, social justice and equality. And um, uh, my big thing at the time was I felt like and you see it even more today that there was an economic slave class being created in, in the United States, that you had the super rich, um, the middle class was being eradicated. And then you had the poor that were basically there to funnel money to the super rich, which unfortunately is still the case. So that was really all of my subtext. And uh, Stars was was fine with all of that. And we also I, I you know, I don't think we could have we could do that show today because, I mean, it was beyond R rated. It was NC-17. Mm -hmm. um, but Rob Tappert and I early on made a decision uh, when we were talking about who are we making this show for? We decided we're not going to make it for anybody. 
we're going to make it for ourselves. We're going to make the show that we would want to watch and just trust that other people will want to come along for the ride. And one of the biggest surprises is, uh, it, you know, it was very popular, a young, uh, you know, uh, among uh, young males, you know, 18 to 34, you know, that sweet spot. But it was also uh, hugely popular with middle aged women. Um, it makes, sense. Really, it makes sense. Yes. Who really they loved the romance. They loved all the male nudity. <laughs> um, and that's also something we came into it. We were like, you know. This kind of stuff has naked women in it all over the place. It's a gladiator show. They're going to be naked. They're going to be fully naked. Everybody had to understand coming in with with the guys, you are going to be more scantily clad than the women in this because it's, you know, it, it's what it it's is. It's a gladiator show. That's it, what people want to see. Um, that's that's amazing. <laughs> uh, so you, I mean, you were you had some time on Daredevil, um, mm -hmm. obviously, which was, I mean, amazing. I, I, I mean, I just love what you guys did with Daredevil. I mean, it was just oh, like, thanks. and it was such a, um, uh, it's such a lot of pressure because you had to, you know, had to, you had to make that fans happy, but you also had to make Netflix mm -hmm. happy because this was the first yeah. big launch of the Marvel stuff on on Netflix. So if it, if Daredevil would have failed, we might have not gotten the rest of the, the rest of the guys, or, or probably it, not. Yeah, it, it would have it would have been a lot less seasons of all these other great characters. Yeah. Um. How did you deal with that pressure, and how did you just kind of like run into that, or did you just, or you just said, "Screw it, let's just write." Well, that was uh, you know, I was on an overall deal at Stars. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I'd, I'd wrapped up uh, Spartacus. Um, I me in the writers' room at had written a full season of a series called Incursion, uh, which was kind of like Aliens meets Band of Brothers. Mm -hmm. um, and we were actually at the point prepping to cast when uh, uh, they pulled the plug because it was too expensive. Um, but I was still on this overall deal. So I was being paid a handsome amount of money to sit at home and think up ideas. And uh, I, I had... Uh, I, I, I did a, a script for stars uh, based on the Italian crime series Romanzo Criminale. And then I was I was working up some other ideas uh, because they didn't feel that was quite right for them. Um, so I had about three months left on this very sweet deal. Uh, when I got a call uh, from Jeff Loeb again out of the blue uh, saying, hey, you know, I'm working with Drew Goddard on Daredevil, which I knew I had met with Drew about a year before. And he asked me if I'd be interested in coming in and co-creating it with him. And I said, man, I would like nothing better. Drew Goddard is one of the most brilliant, sweetest guys you could ever meet. And uh, I said, but I'm on this star's overall deal. I, I can't leave that. That would be silly money to leave behind. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Loeb calls me up and said, <clears throat> Uh, Drew Goddard has to leave. He has a previous commitment to write and direct the Sinister Six mo movie for Sony. Uh, this was before Sony and Marvel made the deal to share Spider-Man. Um, and I said, Jeff, I'm on this overall deal. He goes, well, you know, we could really just just come in and hear what hear what we're talking. We're thinking So I went in and Drew Goddard and Jeff Loeb uh, pitched their idea for the show. And Drew had written the first two scripts. Uh, a couple of rough drafts for the first two scripts. And uh, I read the scripts, I heard their pitch, and my reaction was, ah, damn it, now nah, I've got to do this because I really like it. Um, so I came on to that, and when I came on, you know, we were, everything was really far behind. Uh, you know, um, we had the first two rough scripts. Uh, the third one was being written out of the first 13. We had, you know, we had no production designer, no cast, no anything. And, and we were going to start shooting um, sooner than I would have liked. Uh, and, and our goal was to try to get eight scripts done before we started shooting. I, I think we got to six or seven um, because everything was so far behind. Uh, but Drew had Drew had basically uh, set the table and, you know, g g gave me uh, the menu and, uh, and so I was able to cook up the meal and it was uh, it, it was brutal because we didn't have enough time. Uh, as often the case, we didn't have, you never have quite enough money. Um, and, uh, you, you know, we, we realized 
that it was a bit of a tricky situation because we were going into it. Uh, people, for whatever reason, didn't really care for the Ben Affleck movie. And uh, I, I always say Ben Affleck is is a great actor. Uh, I, I think he was a, he was a good choice for that role. But this was a time where they made the movie where, you know, it was a different time for comic book movies. It was more comic booky. It, it was more comic booky. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It was it was a little over the top. And uh, what really yeah. drew me into it into the TV show was the fact that they wanted to do a darker, grittier corner of the Marvel universe with the street level heroes. And I grew up loving Daredevil <laughs> um, and the character. And uh, we all just wanted to really do justice to the character. But we realized that the comic book fans would come at it uh, with a bit of hesitation because of the movie. And people outside of the comic book would also be influenced by the movie or didn't know who Daredevil was at all. Um, <clears throat> so really, uh, the way we approached the show was the origin story of Daredevil and the origin story of Kingpin, both at the same time. They were both two sides of the same coin. And, uh, and there was a lot of, I mean, it was a difficult show because there was all the pressure because it was the first one in this multi-million dollar four show in a you know spinoff with the defenders deal that was completely unheard of um and as we started working on it uh there were marvel started to get a little nervous that it was a little too dark um so there was some wrestling and 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 i got to preface by saying i loved everybody at marvel uh, Joe Casada, everybody. Um, I, I would I would be in a foxhole with those guys any day of the week. But of course, you know, there's going to be creative wrestling. Uh, so I remember at one point um, to lighten the show up, the suggestion was made that uh, there should be a funny Russian character that keeps trying to say things in English, but it's wrong. It's kind of a running joke. And uh, I, I, I about blew a blood vessel and I said, no, the Russians don't work unless they're scary. They have to be scary. Um, let's not water this down. Of course, we can have humor in the show. Not that kind of humor. Um, so it, it was a, it was a grueling and there was there was a lot of talk about how far do we push it. Um, like you I pushed, remember you pushed it pretty far. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I obviously. I mean, they brought in the guy that did uh, Spartacus, so uh, there's no surprise <laughs> I was about there. To say, some of those death, some of those scenes, I was just like, "Wow, they <laughs> went for it." Yeah, it's like um, the infamous episode at the end of, I think it's episode four, where, where Wilson Fisk uh, crushes the Russian brother's head uh, in, in the car, which uh, um, uh, Drew had pitched to me. It, it was the trunk at the time, not the door, but it was the same idea. So when we got the point of shooting it um we knew if you look at the scene uh you never really see the head being crushed you see the aftermath uh it's more suggestive than anything else but it's still disturbing um the original cut was like three times longer i mean it just kept going on where he was <laughs> banging that guy and uh uh which also brings me to vincent d'onofrio um when i we hadn't cast anybody when i came on and uh, I saw a picture I was looking, you know, just randomly on the Internet um, and I saw a picture of Vincent D'Onofrio with his head shaved. And I'm like, it's the kingpin. The guy's gigantic. He's a phenomenal actor. I mean, there's nobody else that really fits this bill. And so so I, I went to everybody and I said, we should go after Vincent D'Onofrio. And they said, what are you crazy? He makes like a million dollars an episode. <laughs> with the law and order stuff, there's no way we can afford him. I'm like, ah, can we just try? And they go, no, it'll never work. Um, and then they they called me up. Um, and uh, this is a side story. Uh, it, they they called me up and said, hey, we got a great idea. It's a little bit outside the box. Um, Richard Gear. I'm like, what? <laughs> I said, I think Richard Gear is a phenomenal actor. He's amazing. He's not the kingpin. No, it, it'd be like casting me as Superman. <laughs> it's it's just not it's just not right. So uh, but 
we went down the road and uh, but Richard Gere <laughs> turned it down. He wasn't interested. I, I think he made the right choice. And then it turns out our casting director, uh, Lorraine Mayfield, uh, was friends with Vincent D'Onofrio. Uh, she knew him socially. She said, look, let me just reach out to him. Turns out he's a huge Daredevil fan. And uh, he agreed to do it at a greatly reduced price because he loved it. Uh, and, and I remember Jeff Loeb and I having the initial conversation and he said, let's talk about his shaved head. And we thought, oh, shit, you know, he's not going to want to shave his head. Uh, but Vincent said, he's got to have a shaved head, right? I'm, I'm going to shave my head. But just so you know, if I've got to come back and do reshoots or something, we might have to use a bald cap if I'm doing another show. And we said, no. <laughs> anything, anything you want. And him coming on uh, really made such a difference. Uh, him and uh, Charlie Cox. Mm -hmm. um, Charlie Cox, who is possibly the sweetest man alive. Um, and Joe Quesada had, saw, had seen Charlie Cox in something years ago and was convinced that Charlie Cox was the guy. And uh, Charlie came in for an audition. And it was one of the best auditions I've ever seen, but completely wrong. Um, he didn't really know much about the character. In fact, he tells a funny story that uh, uh, shortly before he came in for the audition, he, he called up his agent and goes, is is this guy blind? <laughs> <laughs> and they go, yeah, yeah, he's blind. So Charlie came in and because he had read up about uh, Daredevil and Matt Murdock and about his heightened senses, uh, his take on the character was that there was so much information coming in that he was very withdrawn. So he came in and basically uh, kind of played Matt Murdock as kind of like Rain Man. <laughs> and it was it was a stunning performance. It was mesmerizing, but raw because, you know, Matt Murdock is a bit of a ladies man. <laughs> and, you know, and 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 we told him yeah, that was fantastic. Uh, not quite right. So we gave him some notes. He went away and he came back a couple of days later and did a completely different performance that was just as fantastic. And um, a side note there is that he was a, a very svelte uh, guy. Um, he had never really, uh, you know, he was fit, but he, he didn't go to a gym or anything. That wasn't his thing. So we immediately put him on a program with a trainer. And the like eight to 12 week transformation this guy went through is just stunning. When you actually see him with his shirt off and he's got a six pack oh, and dude, all the muscles. Was, I mean, he worked out like a devil. I, I literally, no pun intended. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, he was no. I, every time I would see Daredevil, I'm like, God, I gotta get back to the gym. Yeah, gotta get back I, to the gym. <laughs> he just, it was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> what he did in such a short period of time. Um, no, do you have do you have a few more minutes? I just wanted to yeah, talk. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, you you um, you jumped into uh, your first feature film, if I'm not mistaken, um, which is a small feature. It was a little independent film, a little, um, little, little independent film. Little, little and there was group. there was a guy who did something before then that you just kind of did a sequel for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you jump into the the studio side of the bit, like the high end studio patent pole world yeah. doing the sequel to Pacific Rim uh, called Pacific Rim Uprising. So you wrote it and you directed it and um, and you worked with Guillermo uh Guillermo del Toro who's the creator of this insane beautiful world yeah. um what was it like getting thrown into that machine because I've spoken to so many uh directors on the show who are at the 150 million 200 yeah. million dollar world it's a completely different kind of filmmaking and and, and oh. that's for experienced guys in that space yeah. this is your first time there what was that like <laughs> who the hell gave me that job that's the first question uh <laughs> It was uh, the best and worst job I've ever had. Um, I got to go back to how how did I get that job? Um, I had written a script called The Dead and the Dying, which was a very Hitchcockian, psycho Hitchcockian psychological thriller uh, with three people in a house. And it was very contained, very small movie. Um, Mary Parent, uh, the, the Uber producer, Ex studio head uh, of MGM uh, read it and really loved it. I had met Mary a few years before because she was a big fan of Spartacus and she knew my agent, so my agent put us together. And uh, I remember at, at that uh, at that meeting, uh, I think it was a breakfast meeting. 
I gave her the rough pitch to this movie idea. And she said, that sounds great. You should write it and you should direct it. And, you know, if you ever get around to writing it, send it to me. We'll talk. So years later, I sent it to her. She really liked it. And so we set it up at Paramount. And this was a little $8 million movie, Tops. Um, and Paramount was going through a lot of changes. And uh, as I discovered, it's very difficult to get a huge studio to pay attention to a little tiny $8 million thriller, at least at the time. I mean, this is before, you know, Get Out came out. And, and streaming and all of that yes, stuff. and streaming and all of that. So, um, so we couldn't get any traction. We had Kerry Washington who wanted to do it like right before Christmas. I met with her. She said, I really like it. I'd love to do it. Um, Paramount, uh, just wasn't geared up to move fast enough. By the time they got around to contacting her people after Christmas, she had signed up for something else. So we lost her. Um, and then I got a call from Mary saying, you know what? Maybe this wasn't meant to be your, your first movie. And I thought, oh shit, she's pulling out. And then she said, what do you think about Pacific Rim 2? I'm like, the hell? That's like going from 8 million to 150? That's just massive shooting all over the world? And I said, uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, a huge Del Toro fan. I mean, you know, all the way. I remember when I was in college, I think, I think it was when I was in college, seeing Kronos yeah. at the theater. Uh, so I, I had followed him. Uh, all through his career, loved what he did. Uh, and I said, yeah, she says, OK, well, you've got to get the approval of several people. But, um, so I had to go in and uh, meet with the people at Legendary. This is before Mary uh, took over Legendary. And they gave me the thumbs up. And then I had to go meet uh, Thomas Tall, uh, the, the owner of Legendary, who's a great guy. I, I, I went to um, uh, deep, deep, deep in the in, in the West Valley to his uh, mansion. Uh, I think I met him right after he had sold the company to Wanda mm -hmm. for like three billion. So he's so doing he all right. Freshly, freshly minted billionaire. He's doing all right. But, he's doing all right. But he was a guy like me. You know, he, he came from a blue uh, uh, a blue collar background. Uh, you know, pulled himself up by his bootstraps and made his fortune. And um, it's funny when we were talking and when I first met him, we were talking about movies. Uh, he mentioned uh, Humanoids from the Deep. Um, and I go, Humanoids from the Deep. I saw that at the drive in, you know, uh, back when I was a kid and it always really stuck with me. And he said, man, I talk about that movie all the time and nobody's seen it. And I said, me too. <laughs> I reference that movie all the time. Um, so we bonded over that. And uh, I was driving uh, home when I got the call from Mary uh, saying she, she, she had talked to Thomas and he gave me the thumbs up. And she said, OK, the last one, you got to go meet with uh, Guillermo del Toro. And I thought, well, that's if nothing else comes of it. I got to meet that'll be enough. I got to meet Guillermo. Did you go to his uh, cool back house? Yes. yes. Bleak house. Bleak I did house. indeed. Nice. So I. I get to uh, weeks later, I, I go to see him. Uh, I meet him at this uh, modest little ranch house, uh, also in the Deep Valley. Uh, and, and I knew it was it was Bleak House, you know, his his famous um, uh, archives of movie memorabilia and art. And I walk in and there's the original Kane's spacesuit from Aliens. And the original stop motion animation models from Jason and the Argonauts and all of this other amazing stuff. And I tell him, Guillermo, I've, I've dreamed for years about coming to see Bleak House. And he says, oh, Stephen, this is not Bleak House. Bleak House is next door. <laughs> he said, this is just where I, I, I take everything in and catalog it and then move it. I go, are you kidding me? <laughs> so he takes me next door to the actual Bleak House and I could have spent a year there. Oh, I mean, yeah. it was... Oh, yeah. It was my childhood dream, you know, because I, I grew up reading, uh, uh, like I mentioned, Famous Monsters of Filmland. And Forrest J. Ackerman had the Acker Mansion uh, in L.A., which was basically the same idea. But this was like that on steroids. And uh, he was just showing me everything. And I could not have been happier. And then we, we talked about the movie. Uh, we talked about some ideas and. Uh, uh, afterwards, he called Mary and said, yeah, he's the guy. Um, and uh, I, I guess the one downside to all this is I love 
Guillermo so much. Anybody that's ever met him, yeah. he is such a brilliant, pure soul who loves cinema and loves art. And the breadth of his knowledge about both is just astounding. It's, it's, it's awe-inspiring. I've had the pleasure of meeting Guillermo two or three times in my life. And he's, the, he's so sweet, so down to earth. And it, it's like the genius that spawns from him is remarkable. It really is. And he curses like a sailor. Uh, no, I <laughs> you don't know, which is, which is also hysterical. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you the one? I saw him at Comic-Con once, and he, this is the story. He goes, working in Hollywood is like eating a shit sandwich. You could put some mayo on it, you could put some nice cheese, but at the end of the day, you're eating shit. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. I, one of my great re regrets is, uh, the movie didn't turn out nearly as well as any of us had hoped, and I'll get into that in a second. But, uh, you know, Guillermo couldn't do the movie because he was going off to do his passion project, The Shape of Water. Did okay with that. Yeah, he, he, he made the right choice. Um, and uh, the studio needed to get this movie out because it was coming up on five years since the last one and anything beyond that, they felt like uh, was uh, too long. So I, I realize I'm practically sitting here in the dark now. <laughs> uh, it's all good. You look, you look fantastic, don't worry. Yeah, yeah that's all that matters. <laughs> um, so un unfortunately, you know, because he went off to do the movie and we did this thing. Uh, so he, he, he wasn't involved because, you know, he was busy, uh, which I always regret. I, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to him since those original couple of meetings. And uh, he, they, I, I would love to see him come back and do the third movie and really get things back on track. So the movie. So I get hired. Uh, I think it was. Uh, I want to say it was March of 2016, I think it was. That sounds right. Um, with the idea that the movie would shoot around that time the next year. Uh, because there was, uh, Guillermo had developed three scripts. Um, and, and we were using some of the influences of some of it. But the studio, the studio had a very strong opinion. There was, there was several things they wanted. They want it to bring in a younger audience, so they want kids to be part of, of the movie on screen. Um, they also, they, they didn't want the action to be at night in the rain. They wanted it to be in the daytime, and more brightly lit, and they wanted the Jaegers to move faster. So uh, this is also three of the things that people complain to me <laughs> the most about when they see the movie. I'm like, mm, that's, that, was my, that was my marching orders. Uh, and I understand why they wanted it. I, I would preface by saying I, I don't have a problem. I, I love the executives on the movie. We had some battles, mm -hmm. but they had a point of view, and I understand their point of view. I, I didn't always agree with it, but I totally understand where they were coming from. And also, they put a lot of faith in me. So um, because we had a, a, not a lot of time, um, I suggested let's put together a TV-type writer's room. We'll break the story. And then I'll take two writers from that writer's room and the three of us will write the script so we can get it done very quickly. So we break the story. We, we go through a, you know, a lot of back and forth. Uh, during that time, Mary takes over Legendary. Um, so she's no longer my producer. She's my studio boss. Um, so we break the story. We turn in the outline. We go back and forth with uh, with some changes. And then we uh, we dig into the script. Um, and, uh, you know, it, we wrote it very, very quickly. I think it was like three weeks. Wow. Uh, once we had the outline, we had like three weeks to write. Uh, we turned in the script and, uh, Mary calls me up and says, wow, I, I'm surprised. I really liked it, <laughs> which was a relief. <laughs> and I'm like, great, fantastic. She was really happy with the story. The story we broke was with, uh, uh, Charlie Hunnam as the lead as Raleigh and Max Martini as his co-pilot uh, playing Herc. So it was very much tied to the first movie. Uh, Mako had become a mucky muck in the uh, PP uh, Pan Pacific Defense Corps. Um, so so uh, it's a huge relief. They like the script. Everything's great. Uh, I'm not shitting you. The next morning I wake up, I sign on to Deadline Hollywood and it's announced um, 
that Charlie Hunnam is doing a remake of Papillon that shoots at the exact same time we are. And, and I met with Charlie, wonderful guy. And uh, he had mentioned this passion project that he wanted to do. So I don't fault him for doing that. It's something he's wanted to do for many, 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 many years. But of course, it put us in a bind. We couldn't push production because of the release date mm. and, and other actor contracts. So we had to throw out a large chunk of that script and quickly come up with a different idea. So the writers and I came up with the idea of this new brother and sister um, uh, as the leads that were basically uh, like protege, pr protégés of uh, Max Martini's character. Um, so we wrote a completely new draft with these two characters. Uh, nobody liked it, including us. So we're like, ah, the hell do we do now? And um, I think it was Guillermo and uh, Mary who came up with the idea of uh, Stacker Pentecost's son, Jake. And my initial reaction was, how do I retcon that to make any sense? But OK, I, I'm willing to give it a shot. And then Mary said, what do you think about John Boyega? And uh, I knew him from Attack the Block and obviously Star Wars. And I said, I, he would be amazing, but there's no way we're going to get John Boyega. I mean, he's doing Star Wars. He doesn't need another big franchise. She said, well, he's coming in for a general meeting. Um, let's put up all the concept art that we've done in a conference room and I'll walk him by it. So that's what she does. She walks him by it and goes, oh, by the way, here's some concept art for this uh, sequel to Pack Rim. And uh, he really dug it. It turns out that he's a huge anime fan. Um, so he was very interested in signing on as, as the star and a producer on the movie. So once we got him, we kicked it into high gear to try to retool this script uh, with the idea of Stacker Pentecost's son, which is very tricky because now we've we need to explain why isn't Raleigh in it and why does Stacker have a son that we've never heard of? And we address all that in the script that eventually gets cut out of the movie, particularly what happened to Raleigh gets cut out of the movie. So, of course, when fans go see the movie, it's like, the fuck is this? Where's where's Raleigh? And you killed Mako? Uh, the whole killing Mako thing in the original script was uh, it, 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 she had much more screen time in the original script. because She had scenes with Charlie Hunnam. Uh, she uh, in the original idea, this didn't make it to the script, but the original idea was uh, her helicopter goes down in Sydney like it does in the movie, but she doesn't die in the crash. She's uh, in a coma, and we had this whole sequence where the Raleigh character went to the hospital with portable drift equipment and got inside her mind to try to bring her out of this coma. And while he's inside, she starts to die, and the world starts to collapse around him. It was really cool, uh, but every, everybody thought you know, the idea of coma was too depressing for this movie. So we had to jettison that. Um, and there was also a big sequence in the movie uh, at her funeral where it was like uh, a 20 Jaeger, column 20 Jaegers of them carrying the funeral down, uh, the coffin down in Japan with the cherry blossoms blowing across. And it was this huge moment that we had to cut because we couldn't afford it at the end of the day. So, um, but so, 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 so so I don't mean to interrupt you. So the, the, the process, and I want people to understand listening, when you're dealing with a $150 million film and the studio wants a release date, so now you're backed into a release date. Yeah. Everything, the creative process becomes much more complicated uh, because one, you're just in this machine that ha the, the train is going. There's nothing you could do to stop it. And, no. and, and it's, it's gonna go and you're building track as you go, yeah. you're building track as yeah, the you're train track where you don't know what the final destination is. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But you have and you have no choice as opposed to yeah. sit down, build a long track. You know where you're going. Take your time, then get the thing yeah. rolling. That's what a normal film kind of does. But at this and I understand why, because the first one was such a huge hit. I think overseas is what really green green lit the sequel. Right. Was it? Is that is that a fair yeah, statement? It was huge. In China. And that's why they were like, we got to get we got to get something else out. I left out the most important part. So when I sign on in March of, of 2016, supposed to shoot the next year, 
uh, a week into me working on the movie, they say, oh, by the way, because of schedules and everything, you've got to start shooting in October of this year. I'm like, what? We don't have a script. We don't have a story. <laughs> we, we don't have a production designer. And then we had all the delays because we lost our main star and we were trying to get a new one and rewriting right. the script. And we really never recovered from that. Um, so we started shooting, I think, late October, early November of that same year, which is for a movie this size is ridiculous. That basically our prep time was cut in half. And it's so, a monster. It's a super complicated film. <laughs> yes. So uh, a lot of that is you do previs um, right. for the visual effects, which in a movie like this is vital because you do the previs of um, what's going on with the Jaegers and the Kaiju. And then you can match the action inside the compod with the actual people. Well, we never had a chance to lock down the previs. So on some of those battles, uh, you know, I'm just kind of winging it inside the cockpit uh, as close as I think we can come to what we think is eventually going to be in the movie. Uh, because we just didn't have enough time. We just, and, and literally, because we didn't have enough time, there were multiple times we'd show up on set and we'd have to wait four hours because the set wasn't done. Like the, the, literally a crew of people with hair dryers trying to dry the set so we can shoot. Um, and, and you just, you just have to roll with it. You have to take um, all your, your shot lists and your careful planning and go, okay, how can I boil down 20 shots into two? Um, which oftentimes can result in, in something better. And, uh, and many times it did on this movie, but yeah. And then after that, you go into, uh, uh, the audience, uh, previews, oh, no. uh, which is a special kind of hell, especially for a movie <laughs> like this, where there's so many visual effects, but we didn't have them in mm -hmm. and we didn't have it in the budget for post viz to put in temps for people to see. So we go into these, uh, 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 previews. And it's just a mess. And, you, you know, the, the audience hates it because most of it is incomprehensible because you can't tell what's going on. Um, and then everybody gets nervous. So you do a bunch of reshoots and retooling and you take things out. Uh, the first cut of the movie was two hours and 20 minutes. Uh, what ended up on screen at the movies was about 90 minutes. So you can imagine there's a lot of stuff that was taken out of the movie, including what happened to Raleigh. Um, and so it's, uh, and again, would I do it again? Absolutely. Listen, when somebody drops out of the sky and say, Hey, do you want to write and direct a $150 million science fiction, fiction epic? You don't say, well, do I have enough time to do it right? No, you say yes. And, 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 and figure it out. Yes. So you were just basically, like you said earlier, you were just holding on for dear life. Essentially. It's like the oh. machine, the machine was just. I mean, and and for and and this is and you're a guy when you get this call, you're not a kid. This is not yeah. your first rodeo. This is yeah. your first rodeo. This is your first rodeo at like the big arena. But yeah. you've been but you've been playing around for a while, directing for a while. You've a showrunner. You understand how the whole process works. And even you with the experience you have, once you get thrown into this machine, it's a completely new experience for you. And you're literally just trying yeah. to hang on. Totally. And, and plus, you know, I, I had shot a bunch of episodes of TV. Right. But in the States, in Vancouver, I mean, now I was flying to Sydney. You know, I had to re relocate to Sydney for like seven months and shoot there. And then we shot a month in China, in Changdao. And then we shot in Iceland. So, you know, I was going all over and I was just just freshly married. I literally got married and I think the next week flew off for seven months. Wow. In Sydney. So it was uh, yeah, it, it was it was difficult. And, you know, look, you hear about movie uh, Jaws being the classic example. Sure. Movies where everything's going wrong and the movie turns out fantastic. <clears throat> uh, th th this was not quite that experience. <laughs> um, there are things in the movie that I'm very, very proud of. And there are things that I'm very, very embarrassed of. Mm hmm. Um, but it's not an exploding baby. It's not an exploding baby. It, it, yeah, I'm not. I'm not that embarrassed. So it's so it's you, uh, you, it's, a, it's a win. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and look, I I I was surrounded by the John Boyega is fantastic. I would work with him again in a second. Um, no matter what was going on, he was always funny and charming, 
and he knew his lines and he knew what he was doing. Uh, you know, we got to discover Kaylee Spaney, who is uh, she played the young girl, Amara, who has gone on to just do amazing things. Um, and it, it was just really a, a, a fantastic, fantastic. I, I got to work with a DP that I'd always love, uh, Dan Mandel, who is J.J. Abrams, uh, main D- DP, who was uh, just fantastic. So many great people and working with people like Bern Gorman and Charlie Day mm-hmm. uh, just just made the hardship um, easier to swallow. <laughs> yeah, much better. But, but really, um, if we had had like a full year to prep the movie mm-hmm. and uh, really dial everything in, I think we could have worked out a lot of the very obvious kinks that ended up on screen. Um, and, and the movie went through some radical changes when we were doing the, the test screenings. Um, it had a completely different ending uh, in Tokyo um, and a lot of other things that we we altered. And, and also, uh, it, it's something we all, I think, now regret um, is because of the test screenings. It was testing really well with little kids like you know eight to 12 year old kids um so a decision was made to retool the movie skewing that way um and to me it's it's kind of the mistake that conan the destroyer did when conan the barbarian was fantastic and then conan the destroyer they made for little kids uh which was just wrong um, I'm hoping the animated series that's coming out on Netflix uh, helps to revive the franchise. Uh, and also, it, it kills me because, like, when people say, oh, my God, I hate you. You killed Mako. Uh, I did it. I always, <laughs> I, I always say, well, you also have to understand, yes, but that death had a lot more meaning when it originally started. It was a lot meatier. And then it, it got whittled down to I agree. It's like a blip, and I'm upset about it. Um, but also I had a plan for the third movie where she does come back in an unexpected way in the third, the end of the third movie, I had always planned to set up a crossover with the monster verse. If that's the way oh that legendary God. wanted it to go. Right. Um, but you know, the, the movie came out, uh, the critics hated it. Um, the, the, the audience, uh, the, the movie, I think broke even, but didn't do as much money as the first movie. Um, so it, it kind of, I think, put the kibosh, at least in the short term, for a third movie. And again, if there ever is a third movie, I hope everybody has enough sense to have Guillermo come back in and, and, and do the third movie. And play in that, and play in that world again. Yeah, it's- yeah, because I personally, as a fan, would love to see that. Um, that it, that's an amazing uh, it's amazing story of how because i always wanted to know what happened behind the scenes of that because i'm like i mean this spartacus he did daredevil and there's obviously something that happened in pacific <laughs> pacific rim rising i'm like there's something there i don't know what it is it's not that if you know, it just was something there so i'm so thankful for setting the record straight on what happened <laughs> behind the scenes um and, and again i don't want people to come up across thinking that i'm saying oh those damn executives no it it's totally understand where the executives are it's 150 million bucks million dollar mark <laughs> uh yeah, the thing that people really want to do is is idiot proof uh a hundred million dollar gamble uh but often by doing that um you can alienate the very people that you need to make it a success very, very much so. And that's pretty, basically the, the theme of Hollywood for the last 150 yeah. years <laughs> or 110 exactly. years or something. Um, exactly. I have a couple of last questions that are rapid, yeah. rapid fire. Um, what is the what is the um, what are three film screenplays that every screenwriter should read? Oh, uh, The Sixth Sense, mm-hmm. um, which is a screenplay that I read before I wrote my little thriller. And um, I, I, I love the movie. I never read the screenplay. I read the screenplay, cried my eyes out. It's just an amazing, amazing screenplay. Highly recommend that. Um, I highly recommend you read anything by James Cameron, particularly yeah. Aliens. Oh, Aliens, it's, it's so good, that script. Aliens is a oh. master class in oh. brevity oh my in God. how he describes things. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal screenplay. And I would also say uh, anything by Shane Black, who yeah. also 
is just the way Shane does scene direction. Oh. I, I envy and drool over because I can never condense it as much as he does. It, it, um, I've read I, I, like reading Long Kiss Goodnight or the original yeah. last last the uh, Boy Scout before yeah. before it gets switched over. Just the, like he takes uh, what would take a normal human <laughs> five yeah. paragraphs and he'll riddle it down to five words and it yeah. just and it pops and it's his, his descriptions are amazing. So yeah. they're they're artistic. They're almost they're almost haikus. <laughs> yeah, they really are. It, it it's it's like a magic trick, and that's what. Uh, when I first started writing screenplays, I made the classic mistake that everyone does. My scene direction was like, you know, huge <laughs> chunks. And um, eventually you learn uh, you want to have as much white on the page as possible mm -hmm. because these scripts have to be read by executives and agents who read 100 scripts a week. And if they get something that's all dense text, uh, you know, they'll they'll read a page or two, but that's it. Unless unless it's like by Quentin Tarantino and then they'll sit down yeah, and read exactly. the whole thing <laughs> or by exactly. Shane Black and they'll read the yeah, whole yeah, thing. There, there are some people that just uh, uh, defy uh, the rules. Yeah. Sorkin, Kaufman, like these kinds of guys that just totally whatever. Totally. And, and people always say, like, you have to have everything. Your punctuation has to be perfect. Well, I read a Charlie. I read a Shane Black script and there was some grammatical errors. I'm like. When you're Shane Black, yes, <laughs> it's okay. I promise you, they're not going to throw it away because the the was in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And to this day, I obsess over the proofing. I'm a terrible proofreader. Yeah. So I have it proofed by other people, usually multiple people, and uh, it, just like every screenwriter you talk to will tell you, you send out your script to everyone, and the second you do, you find another typo. It's so true. Bananas. So true. Um, now, what advice? What advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business today? You know, it's interesting. It's uh, I think it's easier and harder. Uh, if you're trying to break in today, I highly suggest you target television. Television's a lot easier. Uh, movies. The number of movies that have, are being made have shrunk dramatically, and the number of studios making movies have shrunk dramatically. Uh, because of all the consolidation. Um, so and also right now trying to break in the movies because of the pandemic, mm. uh, the release dates are so backed up that um, if, if I were to do Pac Rim uh, Uprising today, it would be a couple of years before they would have a slot to release it because of all the big movies that are backed up, uh, which is, you know, one of the reasons that H uh, Warner Brothers is premiering movies on HBO Max. The other big one is that they want to promote HBO Max. <laughs> um, TV, on the other hand, has exploded in an insane way. Um, you know, back when I started 20 years ago, there were like four and a half networks. And uh, I remember. <laughs> and yeah, and uh, really uh, uh, premium cable um, uh, places like AMC, FX, um, had hadn't started doing original content, and, and even HBO early yeah, it was yeah. I mean, Sopranos it was, it was, was like early what nineties? Was nineties? Yeah, right? yeah. So it yeah, was. I believe a, so. Um, since then, now with the streamers, I mean, there's over five hundred uh, scripted TV shows on per year. Now, this is a plus and minus because when I started, shows were twenty two to twenty four episodes a season, so you knew going in that you had a job all year. And generally, you would take three or four weeks off, and then you would start on the next season. Um, so it was it was also great because uh, there was enough episodes and enough time. When I was starting out, I got to be on set, in casting, in editing, um, you know, the, the whole gamut, which really taught me how to run a show and, and taught me how to direct. Nowadays, it's more standard to do eight episodes um, right. because there's an algorithm out there that says... <laughs> That's the sweet spot where an audience will finish all eight. Um, I, creatively, I think eight is not good. Not for a, not a for a season. For a miniseries, yeah. it's a, it's 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 a little too long yeah. for a miniseries. Even six is a yeah. good sweet spot for a miniseries. Exactly. That's what I felt with with Gods of the Arena that it was a real sweet spot. Uh, but for me, ten epi ten to thirteen episodes is satisfying uh, as a storyteller. Uh, you take a look at Daredevil. If we had only had eight episodes, you wouldn't have gotten Fisk's backstory when he was a kid. 
we wouldn't have done stick. Uh, you know, there was a lot of things that we would have just cut and mm -hmm. it would have felt rushed, uh, quite frankly. Um, but because there are so many shows going on, there is a constant need for writers. Um, uh, so TV is just it, it's boom. It's a boom town. Right, in yeah. TV. Yeah. There's it, so many things being done. It is so hard to put together a staff these days. Because there are so many shows vying for those writers. Now, and uh, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? <clears throat> film business or life? Um, God, that's a good question. I feel like I'm still learning lessons. Um, I think really the hardest lesson is that I'm still struggling with is balancing creatively what I know is right and balancing that commercially what is necessary <laughs> those two things can be very very difficult and that's the other great thing about tv now is um all the streaming services they're willing to try things that are very 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 much outside the box and that's why now you get shows uh queen gambit you know, queen's gambit perfect example you, you get queen's gambit you get the boys right um even things like um uh the oa which right. was completely batshit crazy and i loved it uh, there's no way 20 years ago when I was starting out, anybody would have right. done that. And, and things like Wayne that I think is just absolutely stunningly brilliant. Um, the streamers are willing to take chances uh, because there's so many shows. You have to do something to roll those dice. You know, everybody will keep doing the standard stuff, but they're also willing to take these outside of the box chances. Um, which is completely thrilling uh, for me to see at this point. Um, uh, so, yeah, th that and, and in TV, because of that, you have a lot more creative leeway than you do in features. Features has become a very, very difficult business that's dominated by tentpole movies. Um, and, and, you know, I know there are critics out there that say, oh, the Marvel movies, they've ruined the cinema. I love the Marvel movies. I think they are uh, they they encapsulate everything that I love. They're exciting. They're uh, technically brilliant. They're um, funny and they are emotional. Uh, you know, I have cried at oh. Marvel movies probably more than than any other movie. I mean, I end, mean end game. I mean, come on. In game, in game, and Infinity War both oh. killed me. Oh, it's, I mean, but to be fair, if you pull Marvel movies out of the last decade, mm -hmm. the entire theatrical business would have, I think, crumbled because I think they held it up for this last ten years. Honestly, yeah. And Kevin Feige, I, I met Kevin Feige um, many, many years ago when he was uh, Avi Arad's right hand man. Mm -hmm. uh, back when Avi uh, really controlled most of the Marvel properties. And uh, I, I'd, I would go in with meetings for Avi uh, like uh, twice a year. I, I would get a call. Avi wants to talk to you about this. And I, I don't know <laughs> if anybody knows Avi. Avi is, is uh, he's a character. Um, uh, he was, uh, I think, an Israeli toy guy that he, he made his fortune in toys. <laughs> And uh, he would always come into the room. He would have a ring on every single finger of his hand, a Marvel ring from the characters and always wearing a Marvel T-shirt because he loved the world. And uh, I actually got hired to, to write a script for The Punisher 2. Nice. Uh, uh, my, my Punisher 2 uh, never got made. There were many, many writers after me. Uh, they brought me in because at the time, um, this was before I worked on Spartacus, uh, but they wanted a gritty R rated. Um, they pitched it to me as like, imagine taxi driver right. at the Punisher. And I go, I'm your guy. Get sold. So, so I wrote a very, very, very fucking dark Punisher movie. <clears throat> and they read it and they said, yeah, we can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is way too dark. <laughs> Yeah, but but with Kevin Feige, Kevin Feige, uh, yeah, I, I could not have more respect for this guy because he was Avi's right hand man for many, many, many years, and he saw you know Marvel movies uh, with even with the best of intentions, kind of done wrong, right? You know, and he got his chance, and he built 
this incredible, I can't believe the amount of movies they did in 10 years. Amazing. And the quality um, is just absolutely phenomenal. And the interweaving of all the stories and the characters. Stunning. I mean, he just did what the the comics have been doing for for decades. They just did it in movie form, like crossovers and stuff. That just was never done in tentpole films. The changes they made in the movies were all really good. Uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, I remember growing up and reading the, the Infinity Gauntlet yeah, uh, yeah. story. And, you know, they didn't try to translate that directly into a movie, which would have been nearly impossible because it was all cosmic and very out there. And the way they took it and made it so emotional and so <sighs> grounded despite the epic cosmic uh, uh, content was just absolutely stunning. I mean, those two movies wrecked me. When when Peter Parker is is oh no, stop stop stop. I mean stop. oh <laughs> stop. Talk about a, a grown man crying. But really, it's like <laughs> all of those movies. Um, just when I watch them, uh, no pun intended, they are a true marvel. Yeah. And and I don't think uh, a lot of people, especially at other studios, understands why they work. Yeah, because they they try to replicate it, mm-hmm. but there is a magic, and and it starts with I firmly believe I, I love DC. I grew up on DC and Marvel. Marvel's characters are something very very special. Uh, growing up and reading them, uh, the way Stan Lee and, and and the whole bullpen put together those characters uh, with real world problems. Uh, I remember going back to when I was a kid and I, I read, you know, the classic uh, when when Stacy dies. Oh, uh, and I was gutted as a kid. And then I went back uh, many years later when I was on Buffy and, and I reread it. And there's a whole subplot with um, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Osborne, not Norman Osborne. His oh, the son. kid, the kid. Oh, yeah, I know you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, who I'm talking about where. Uh, he got hooked on, I think, heroin or something. Right. It was a whole, it was a whole right. drug thing. <laughs> right. That was and, in, that's insane to do that back then. Insane. Yeah. And there were all of these great moral choices, that great daredevil issue when uh, he's fighting um, Bullseye and they're hanging over the city and he decides to drop him because he doesn't want him to kill anybody else. I mean, those kind of things just really, really got me. And... Uh, the genius of Kevin Feige is taking all those stories, making them, forming, helping form them into the real world. And uh, just stunning. I mean, uh, Avengers, Age of Ultron, I know some people didn't like it. I personally really loved it. <laughs> but the whole, all four Avengers movies, when you look at them, it's just such a marvel. It's also when people say, oh, CGI is ruining the movies. I'm like, are you kidding me? I... Look, you can't like the stuff like I'm all about like what Nolan's doing and do as much in camera as you can. And when you can do stuff absolutely. in camera, absolutely. But you can't do in camera stuff in the Marvel Universe a lot of times because it's just so. Yeah, it just doesn't exist. Like try to do Doctor Strange in camera like that's going to be a yeah. bit rough. <laughs> that's going to yeah, be a bit rough. Uh, Doctor Strange is a perfect example, um, uh, a movie that, that I thoroughly enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and one of the best characters in the movie is his cape. <laughs> which has had so much personality and it's great and also when the magic starts to happen and the city's folding in on itself oh, so it's beautiful such a mind bender but with visual effects i also go back to uh did you not like the visual effects and broke back mountain and people say what visual effects i'm like exactly <laughs> there's a ton of visual effects in broke back mountain but you don't notice them because they're designed not to be noticed right Exactly. And uh, every every major thing. And I always find a problem. I always tell people, and I've had this conversation with a lot of other screenwriters on, on the show, is where DC's characters, you're writing for gods. And it's really difficult to create co- conflict with a god like Superman. Like there's not much that can beat him. And throwing the rock on him uh, is a rough. It's like, OK, that's old. We get kryptonite. But with with every single Marvel character, even a god like Thor is so vulnerable. Yeah. And and even though he I don't I don't know if he can die or not, but the way they write him, the way he he worked the Hulk, 
you feel it. Whereas in the yeah. other characters, that's why I always think Batman is a Marvel character who's in the DC universe. Batman, yeah. right? He 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 could yeah. so fall right into Marvel's universe and not even blink. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 you you've, you've hit a, a very a, a very salient point. Is that in the DC universe, a universe that I love, mm -hmm. is a lot of the main A list characters are gods trying to be human. Where in the Marvel, it's humans trying to be gods, basically. And, um, and that's and, the difference. It, it's tricky when you have, you know, a, a Wonder Woman or a Flash, Superman, Green Lantern. Superman. At least with the Flash, he's a guy who got powers and, you know, is. But is, still a god, though. His, his powers are, are absolutely godlike. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and I, I, I love both universes. Me too. I know, I know DC has struggled with theirs but i also think part of that struggle is um they saw the success of marvel and trying to catch up to them in a short form just doesn't work not with uh <clears throat> no i mean that's i mean justice league was obviously plagued with uh difficulties but one of the biggest difficulties is you know the marvel universe spent years and years and years introducing these characters right. before they put them all together Mm -hmm. So you had time to get to know them uh, with with the Justice League, uh, with Batman versus Superman. Most of them you just saw briefly on a hard drive. Right. So you, so you didn't get a chance to live with them. And I, I, I don't fault DC for it at all, for trying to get there because, you know, the Avengers movies were making billions of dollars. Let's uh, let's get there. And I, I am an unabashed fan of Zack Snyder's work. Oh, um, I'm I, I I agree with you, and I'm very looking forward to the Schneider cut. I I am actually yeah, me too. I'm really looking forward to the Schneider cut, and uh, I think DC is starting to find its its legs. Yeah. I think they're finding their legs now, and uh, we'll and we'll it, we'll see where it goes. And I also th I think a lot of the shit that Zack Snyder gets is that um, I, I think a lot of times people have a hard time separating screenwriting from directing. Because I, I've had a lot of people saying, oh, I, I love your directing on Spartacus. It's like, I never directed one episode. I was just writing the show. <clears throat> and with Zach, I think they often blame him for the exact story. Uh, because you, you cannot look at Zack Snyder's work and say he's a bad director. No. He's an amazing director. Remarkable. Look, I, I feel the same way about Michael Bay. You can't look at Michael Bay's work and say he's a bad director. You can disagree with story stuff. But my God, having directed a hundred and fifty million dollar movie, I can tell you this: Michael Bay is a fucking magician. I don't know how he does it. He does it like while he's drinking coffee and he's just like yeah. the, it's smoking a cigar. He doesn't even. It's like when Tony, like Tony Scott and and Ridley, when yeah. they do their, they just they've just done it so long. I've actually been a defender of Michael Bay on multiple of my shows. I'm like, look, when Michael Bay came out, when The Rock came out, all action films changed after The Rock. Yep. After after The Rock, after Armageddon, all action films changed after 300 completely changed the way yep. so many things were shot because those you got to give that credit the the technicians behind it the craftsmanship um yeah. you can't i mean bay i mean visually amazing i mean when spielberg goes you know he's a pretty good visual director <laughs> that's <Yeah>. saying something <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you, you know, I, uh, I I always think about Sucker Punch, uh, oh. which I know, I, I know a, a lot of people have problems with. Not talking about any of the story. It's beautifully uh, shot. I, there's that scene on the train where they're fighting the robots, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I met with Larry Fong. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we were briefly discussing possibly him coming on to do Pacific Rim Uprising, and and I, I love Larry. And I asked him, Larry, I got to ask you, how the hell did you shoot that? Because I've watched it like a dozen times and I can't figure out how you shot it. And, and his response was, I have no idea. <laughs> Just turn the camera on. But I have no idea how we shot that. It was, um, <laughs> but you know, uh, ignore script, ignore story. Just look at that sequence. Um, and looking at it from a director's point of view, there are so many times I will look at a sequence and say, I don't know where to start. Uh, I can't tell you where I would start to. Try to shoot. I, I feel the same way. Um, um, Kill Bill with the the big fight in the, uh, in, in the in the nightclub. It's like, how do you even start to plan this? 
Oh my God. Um, just, it's just, I, I'm much more comfortable with two people in a room talking. Uh, you know, that, that, that's my sweet spot. <laughs> um, the other stuff I, I, I always consider myself first and foremost, a writer. I will be learning how to direct for the rest of my career. And, okay. and I'm just, I'm inspired by, by all of these amazing, amazing directors. And I, I study their work trying to figure out how, how the hell would I even approach something like this? Listen, I've talked to, other, I've talked to people uh, on the show who are really very big accomplished directors who've done a ton of stuff. And then we start geeking out about Fincher. Like we'll just yeah. start, we'll just start geeking out about Fincher and how he like, they're like, Oh man, did you see that shot? Like how the hell did he do that? And how, and how is it doing? Like there's just certain guys in our, and gals in our, yeah. in our, in our space who do things like Catherine Bigelow can shoot the hell out of any action. Amazing. Movie. I mean, she's one of the best action directors um, of her generation. There's no question. She doesn't get the credit she deserves. But you start looking at these directors and you just go, I don't even. So when you as a, an accomplished director can look at another director in the business and go, how the hell yeah. <laughs> did you do that? That's a, that's the highest compliment you can do. And, then, and obviously you look at Kubrick or something like that. You're just like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's important for anybody in the business uh, to realize. I mean, that there's the rarefied air of like of Spielberg. But even Spielberg, when you watch the documentary about him saying that, you know, there's a bit of terror every time he steps onto the set because he doesn't know quite what he's going to do. Right. Um, uh, but I think it's so healthy to admire other directors, other writers. Um, and really aspire because uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a TV show and me and my other professional friends who have had long careers saying, man, yeah, I, it just made me want to stop writing because I just don't know how I'm going to. We all felt that way when we watched Wayne. It's like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> I just watch this shit up. Right. Yeah. You watch, you watch something Nolan does and you're just like, well, yeah, I I'll never get there. <laughs> I'll try. But that's. I don't even know how he's doing this. It's, exactly. it's and when you watch and, and like I watched the opening sequence to um, the first 20 minutes of Clockwork Orange the other day. And my God. Yeah, it holds to this day. Like it's absolutely it would you hold those first 20 minutes. You're just like, how did he get away with that? That would there would be a, there would be riots in the streets today if that was released by a major studio. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's just there are so many inspiring people. And, uh, you know, ultimately. For me, I always come back to the little kid in New Jersey who was yes. uh, yeah, like Luke Skywalker. I, if there was a center of the universe, I was the furthest from it <laughs> where I grew up in, in New Jersey. We didn't even have a movie theater. I had to, I had to ride <sighs> my bike to the next town over a half hour away, which was brutal in the winter, let me tell you. <laughs> um, but to me, whenever things get really hard or tough, and, and they get hard and tough a lot. I always remind myself that I, I am living the dream of that little kid uh, because I love what we do. I, I love trying to create that magic. And I love taking big swings. And sometimes they work. And sometimes you get an exploding baby. Um, you just never know. <laughs> Can I quote you on that? When you take a big, sometimes it works and sometimes you get an exploding baby. The best, best quote totally of the show. True. <laughs> Best it's totally true. <laughs> my friend thank you steve so much for being on the show man i know we could talk for at least another couple of hours but i appreciate you well, again sometime after my my, my next uh, big failed movie comes out <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate that brother thanks again man my pleasure thanks for watching click on one of the videos below to continue your journey and don't forget to subscribe